In this uh, session, I am going to talk about co-integration. What does it mean with respect to the time series analysis? And uh, as an application of the co-integration, I am going to take up a financial application which is cross-hedging. Where I have to do a hedging of the risk associated with one financial instrument using another, probably the futures of some other kind of a security. Definition wise, I am not going in depth in this, uh, in, in this session because here the context is how do I really use R for all these kind of purposes. First thing, when I talk about co-integration, the major intention is I want to get to a linear combination, right? My intention is to create a linear combination between a non-stationary kind of a time series. For a non-stationary time series, right? This, that, that particular time series whose mean, variance and other statistical properties are not constant. I want to have some kind of a linear combination of this particular non-stationary time series wherein I can really convert it into a stationary time series. That is where I am using the concept of co-integration. So my objective is to convert a non-stationary time series into a stationary one. So, because of that reason, once I am able to do that, I would be able to detect long-run relationships between the variables. That is where I will take the example of cross-hedging. We can take the long-run relationship between the two non-stationary time series data. If I have a non-series times non-stationary time series data 1 and non-stationary time series data 2, I should be able to identify the long-run relationship between these two data points. Now, for that, I want to really take an example associated with cross-hedging. And the way I want to handle this example is, I have taken a data set which contains the data relating to Sensex Midcap Index. The data for this is collected from somewhere 2003 April to 2016 March. So almost uh, 14 years of data has been collected, 13-14 years of data has been collected. And uh, this particular, uh, the, this is the kind of, a, so my, my portfolio, what I want to really look at is, my portfolio is more or less mimicking this particular index. So my portfolio is uh, moving more or less in the same lines as this particular index. So I really want to hedge this. Right, because there is a lot of uh, volatility in the mid cap index possibly. So I really want to hedge, if not fully, at least a part of my total exposure to this changing mid cap prices. So this is where I want to look at probably the futures market or for that matter any other market with which, uh, or first let me look at the futures market. Let's assume that the mid-cap futures is not available on the market and there is no OTC derivatives contracts that are traded with respect to the Sensex mid-cap. So directly I don't have any kind of instruments. So, I am trying to look at something relatively traded kind of a contract. And uh, for that for that time being, 
let's say I have narrowed down on using the sensex to hedge this particular exposure. So mid cap exposure, I wanted to hedge through the sensex. So I really want to find out what is the optimal hedge ratio, which means how many units of sensex do I really need to go short on or long on if at all I want to hedge one single unit of the mid cap futures. So this is what I am calling as the optimal hedge ratio. So this optimal hedge ratio initially we will look at a classical approach. So when I am saying classical approach, I will look at short term fluctuation. My focus is on short term fluctuations of both the mid cap prices and the sensex prices. The item that I am going to hedge and the asset with which I am going to hedge my asset. So the, the asset to be hedged and the asset with which I am going to hedge. So both the things I look at the short term fluctuations of the prices between both of them. So that is the first approach, which is what we are calling as the classical approach. And after that, we can also look at the long run stable relationship between both the prices so that we can improve the hedge ratio. So this is what is a two step process as a part of the hedging process. Initially, we are looking at a short term, uh, how the short term prices are fluctuating, differences in the prices. Then we are looking at long term stable relationship between both the prices. Now, let's try to look at that particular aspect using R. Here, for doing this activity, I want to use one package which is built in as a part of R, which is called as ARCA package. So basically, this is having lots and lots of functions especially to do with the co-integration wherever I would like to use co-integration wherein I am looking at two different time series which are non-stationary kind of nature. So that is where co-integration comes into picture and wherever I want to use the co-integration as a concept, it's better that I rely on the ARCA package. So I'll try to install the ARCA package as well along with the zoo package. So I think uh, R is already in, uh, uh, opened here. So let me install the package. I'll install the package named Arca. U-R-C-A. Alright, I'm installing this particular package called Arca. Yes. Okay, this particular package is installed. So I'll load both library. I'll load both the zoo package, which has already been installed earlier, and I'll also be loading Arca package now. I've already uh, installed it, so we are loading even the Arca package. So both these things are being loaded. Now we need to get the price data. For that, I have maintained it in an Excel sheet. I have the mid cap data right from 2003 April till 2016 March. Similarly, I want to hedge that using the Sensex. So, if uh, actually I should hedge it using Sensex futures, but yeah, as an assumption, let's take these are the Sensex futures itself. Right? In reality, they are uh, the Sensex values. But for our understanding purpose or for the way of, for the purpose of using this in R, let's call this column as the Sensex Futures itself. So this is the kind of a data. So my portfolio is more or less replicating this. I want to hedge the risk of this particular portfolio using these particular futures. So that is how I want to look at my problem. So let me uh, bring this 
data into R. So for this, I will call some prices or some uh, index values. Right? Let me call it as index. Let me just simply call it as ind val, which is the index values. Right? And uh, we have already dealt with read dot zoom, which is more talking about reading a time series data. Now, where is my file? In my E drive. R data is the name of the folder. And uh, this file name is called as sensex midcap.csv. So sensex midcap.csv. Right? So this is the name of the file that I am loading. Now, because it's a CSV file, obviously my separator is going to be a comma. We have seen that the headings are there in the first row, so that's where we are calling header equal to true. And now the date, this is a monthly data. So that's where we'll say a fun argument, which is talking about uh, the format of the function. So we have dealt it even in our earlier uh, video where I will call it as year mon, which is it will be treating the data as year and month. The format of the data in our Excel file or CSV file is a full year slash the month number. So full year is typically uh, mentioned with percentage Y slash the month number is with percentage M. So these are the various things I am loading as a part of my indval. So indval typically contains the data. So let's check what this indval typically contains now. So these are the data that are present as a part of indval. These are the months, April 2003, because we have given the format as year one. This is how the format is going to come out. So April 2003, May 2003 and so on. These are the mid-cap values. These are the sensex values. Now, the first part we have already uh, talked about as a part of the hedging. The first part is the classical approach where I am looking at only the short-term behavior. Where I am looking primarily from the perspective of the changes in the monthly prices of both the asset to be hedged and the instrument that is being used to head this particular asset. And based on that, we are deriving the minimum variance hedge ratio, or which is what is called as the optimal hedge ratio. So for the short term purposes, we are only looking at the changes in the monthly prices for both the the, the spot price as well as the futures with which we are going to hedge the spot. And uh, this is where we are fitting a linear model between these two. So the, we know that the linear model in R is executed through a function called LM. So that is what we are going to talk about. So this particular linear model will talk about the changes in the changes in your uh, mid cap prices, how much of changes in the mid cap prices are explained by the changes in the sensex values. So to what extent the changes of this are explained by this. So this will become my dependent variable. This will become my independent variable. And whatever the beta that comes out through this particular approach, that is what we can consider as the optimal hedge ratio. So let's try looking at the optimal uh, hedge ratio in this case. Right, I'll look at uh, the differences in the prices. So let me take, uh, probably uh, we'll uh, talk about uh, a very simple model simple underscore mod or simple model, we can simply uh, take it, wherein I want to take the linear model. So in the linear model, my first variable is my dependent variable. 
what is my dependent variable i want to take the differences in the prices right mid cap prices so what is uh, my variable indval is the variable and for that particular indval i want to take the mid cap value so the difference in the mid cap values is my dependent variable i'll put a tilde sign and i'll also put my independent variable which is nothing but difference of the ind indval is the name of my uh, data file and when that i'm considering sensex so this is my independent variable and uh, i could very well uh, give whether i want to include the intercept as a part of my regression model or not if i want to include the intercept i can close this here but if i don't want the intercept coming as a part of my regression model i can very well say plus 0 so when i am doing a plus 0 in my uh, linear model it means that i don't want to include the intercept so i want to set the intercept term directly to 0 so this particular model right i got a simple model so it is estimating the coefficients wherein i am looking at a best fit relationship between the mid cap change in prices versus a sensex change in values over a period so we can simply look at the summary associated with the simple mod right let's see what this result has come up wow uh, now you could see that there is a linear model applied where we are talking of the formula is the difference of the individual mid cap values versus the difference of the individuals uh, ind values sensex these are the residuals in the process right the minimum residual is minus 899 the maximum is plus 842 the coefficients are coming out to be something like this the difference individual sensex the estimate is around 0.42 standard error is around 0.01 and which is resulting in a probability value which is the p value of less than 0.05 p value is q into 10 to the power of minus 16 so the p value is much much less than 0.05 so which actually tells that the independent variable is significant independent variable is significant in terms of determining your de dependent variable and whatever is the coefficient that has come out that is what is the beta and beta is nothing but the optimal hedge ratio here right so we have got the data out here so we got a hedge ratio in this example so we can very well say if i am looking at only the short term changes short term price changes the hedge ratio is optimal hedge ratio is 0.4257 so to hedge one unit of mid cap we require 0.4257 units of the sensex so we need to take a position in 0.4257 units of sensex to hedge the risk that is involved in one unit of the mid cap and you could see that the standard error in this case is only 0.0189 obviously the cross hedge is not perfect if it is perfect even i would have got a one here so which means the portfolio even after the hedging of the portfolio there is some level of risk that is inherent to some extent i can reduce my risk but it is not completely eliminated so to some extent risk still lies in this portfolio 
so my next objective is is there any way i can improve on this hedge ratio and this is where we can look at the long term relationship right so till now i have not used anything to do with the co integration or any of the stuff right so the co integration to use the co integration only i have actually loaded the arca package and co integration is more and more useful when i have to look at the non stationary behavior between the two time series this is where the opportunity comes so i am looking at i want to improve this edge ratio so this is where i am looking at a long term relationship between the uh, between the uh, levels both of the mid cap as well as the sensex right so basically what i can look at is i can do the plotting of both of them just to really see how both of them are really moving so first let me look at my portfolio which is the mid cap i'll take a plot right i'll take a plot of my particular portfolio so i'll say indval hyphen mid cap or uh, dollar mid cap that is my particular portfolio's performance because my portfolio is mimicking the index so i am trying to plot for that particular data right and i can very well uh, put a heading saying mid cap so i'll put a kind of right mid cap versus sensex performance okay so this is the kind of heading let's put and probably uh, on the x axis we can put a label as date and on the y axis we can put the values as index right the index values all right let's try out so there is a kind of a plot that is coming for the mid cap now to this i want to add my sensex line so because i want to add a line to this i am using the function called line wherein i am looking at indval dollar my particular whatever is the hedging so sensex is the field that i am using for the hedging purpose so the name of the data file and dollar and the column heading probably if required we'll use a different color let's say let me use column color is red and if required we can also use a different uh, uh, line type so let's put a line type as two okay some kind of a dotted line is coming out and this is how the uh, the values associated with x are typically moving right uh, we could uh, we could even set the y limit to make the graph more interesting so what can very well happen is when we are plotting the y itself i'll add one more aspect here wherein i'll say y limit will change the y limit probably from 2000 no uh, probably uh, we can change the y limit from 900 to 30000 we'll set the y limits from 900 to 30000 so that's the reason this has come in this way and we'll add the lines to it so the sensex is coming in this way so this is the way the sensex is moving and the black one is showing this is the way so if i have to set my y axis or something i can use y lim and x axis if i have to set some specific values i can use x lim so this is the kind of a graph that is coming out between both of them all right now now there is some kind of an upward pattern in both of them so there is not too much of stationarity being observed in the process but technically to really come out with whether there is non stationarity present in the data or not 
we can very well use a two step estimation technique right to really check whether your data is stationary or not i can very well use a two step estimation technique so first step is i want to test both my mid cap as well as my sensex for unit root unit root is a test associated with non stationarity of the data and for that we actually use theoretically if you know this we use what is called as an augmented dicky fuller test right dicky fuller test is actually being used to test whether the series is non stationary or not right so we will try to check both of them both uh, uh, for mid cap as well as for sensex we can very well check whether the series is stationary or non stationary right we can very well test whether our series is a stationary or non stationary for this we use from the arca right so we'll first test for mid cap mid cap underscore augmented dicky fuller test that is the name of the variable i am calling so we have a function called ur dot df from the arca package we are talking of dicky fuller test so that is what we are calling as ur dot df so i am looking at indval slash or uh, dollar mid cap so i am typically uh, looking at uh, the mid cap values wherein the type right once you type the help you will know what are the variables what are the values that you can give we are looking at with drift with drift is there is a kind of a constant growth that is happening the average increase in the values that are uh, that, that are coming over a period so we are looking at applying a dicky fuller test on the mid cap prices similarly i can apply it on the sensex values as well okay so this is what we got when we did it on mid cap similarly i can very well do it on sensex as well so let me run even the sensex one also sensex underscore adf so i could simply take individual and i'll take sensex here so both of them the augmented dicky fuller test for the unit test unit root testing is typically initiated so let's look at the summary of both of them so let me start with the summary associated with mid cap underscore adf okay so these are some of the results that came out using this dicky fuller test right we could see that the test the regression dip, drift because we have given the drift as the type so we are testing it the formula is i am looking at the z difference versus z lag 1 the difference in the z values versus the z value of the previous period and the z difference of the previous period so i am looking at the z value of the previous period as well as the z difference of the previous period and the current period's difference is what is being taken as the dependent variable this is what is an augmented dicky fuller test including the intercept so basically there are two variables that we are looking to find out the difference in the z values of the current period to find out the difference in the values of the current period i am taking the actual value of the one period before as one variable and the uh, actual difference associated with the previous period so basically uh, to model the difference associated with the current period x2 minus x1 is the current period difference 
I am taking it as depending on x1 and also the previous periods are different. The period difference is x2 minus x1. The previous period difference is x1 minus x0. So there is one variable x1, the other variable is x1 minus x0. And I am also including the interceptor. That is what is happening as a part of the augmented decay puller test. It's again a regression, but that is what is typically getting performed in an augmented decay puller test. So the residuals are minimum residual is this much, maximum is this much. So this is an analysis of the residual. Look at the coefficients. Right, the for, with respect to lag one, this is the coefficient minus 0 0.02. And with respect to the difference of the lag 1, it is the coefficient is 0.11. Now, what is, look at the p-values. 1 with respect to lag 1 and even the difference with respect to lag 1. The p-values, both of them are greater than 0 0.05. Both the p-values associated with this augmented decay fuller test right they are greater than 0 0.05 so obviously we know that the null hypothesis cannot be rejected right the null hypothesis cannot be rejected and what is the null hypothesis the augmented decay puller talks about the null hypothesis is associated with non-stationarity the null hypothesis is associated with non-stationarity. I cannot reject the null hypothesis. Right? I cannot reject the null hypothesis. So, which means I can very well assume that the mid-cap values are not stationary. I am very clearly uh, getting a statistical test saying that the mid-cap values are not stationary. Basically, I am looking at the dependence on the previous period's value. The difference between the current and the previous period, depending on the previous period value, is a major assumption associated with the non-stationarity. And here it is very clearly uh, saying that uh, there is not there is not much of uh, a dependency with respect to the previous period value, which means there is a possibility of non-stationarity very much present in the data. The same logic I can test it with respect to Sensex as well. So I'll say summary of summary of what is that uh, variable that we have used sensex underscore adf so let me call it as sensex underscore adf even in this case the p value is greater than 0 0.05 the p value associated with the lag is greater than 0 0.05 so i cannot reject the null hypothesis and here the null hypothesis is associated with non-stationarity of the data so, the null hypothesis associated with non-stationarity cannot be rejected, which means both the mid-cap values as well as the sensex values, both of them are non-stationary in nature. This is a very interesting observation from the data. Both of them are non-stationary. This is where the co-integration comes in more and more handy. Now that we came to know that both of them are non-stationary, so we are trying to look at the static equilibrium between both of them and basically uh, test the residuals that are coming out for the stationary time series. We are going to test the residuals that are coming out for a stationary time series. And even that we are doing through an augmented decay fuller test itself. So, which means I am primarily looking at finding out 
not the differences i am primarily looking at finding out the relationship between the prices itself between the original values itself now so i am going to take an lm right probably let me do i want to do a modified i want to do a modified model wherein i want to take the linear model now it's not between the changes in the prices of both of them i am actually looking at the prices of both of them so i am directly uh, taking mid cap as my dependent variable till day sign i am considering the sensex as my independent variable so i am directly taking this particular part so my mod underscore model is coming out to be this for which i am going to store the summary for the same so i'll call it as summary underscore mod underscore model this i am going to store the summary associated with mod underscore model so whatever uh, came through the mod underscore model i am taking the summary of the same so if i am looking at what is the summary that is coming out i'll go with summary underscore mod underscore model which is uh, showing that this is the intercept this is the individual sense x value the p value is less than 0.05 and i also have these are the different uh, standard errors that are coming out and uh, there are some amount of residuals that are coming out so this is what i really want to store now if you have uh, uh, looked at the mechanism we said that first i will find a static equilibrium and after that i'll do the testing of the residual so i have to capture the residual i'll use a variable called error where i'll be capturing the residuals associated with my summary whatever uh, is the summary that i have got right uh, what are the residuals that are associated with the summary is what i am going to capture so if you look at my error term it contains for each of the things what are the residuals that have typically come out and now i will be performing the uh, augmented dickey fuller test on the residual values i will not perform it on the original data i am performing the augmented dickey fuller test on the residual values which means i'll say error underscore augmented dickey fuller if i want to really find out so i am using ur dot df which is the function associated with uh, dickey fuller test so which i would be performing on the error data and here i'll not be choosing the type as drift because this is not uh, something that is the the error is not increasing in a particular fashion so i am not putting any kind of an any kind of a type here so my error is getting plotted as an augmented dickey fuller test so i can very well look out for the summary that is associated with error underscore adf now this is where you could see a very interesting part right now the and uh, now we are actually executed the dickey fuller test on the error term residuals i wanted to really look at the stationary time series associated with the residuals now this is where we got the test statistic right you could very well see what is uh, the p value here 0.0522 right we got the test statistic here as 0.0522 obviously it's uh, slightly greater than 0.05 but to a large extent it is much lesser
So the p value here is slightly greater than 0 0.05, but it is almost lesser. Probably it's very much uh, around 0 0.05. So I can very well reject the null hypothesis just for an understanding. Probably if it has been much lesser than 0 0.05. It would have been much more better. I could have rejected the null hypothesis of non-stationarity, which means I can very well assume that the residuals are coming out more and more stationary. Right from this, I am able to make out that the residuals are more and more stationary. So if the residuals are more and more stationary, I can very well confirm that both my variables are co-integrated. So how do I really come out with uh, the testing associated with uh, co-integration? First thing is I am looking out for the unit root test. Right? I am looking out for the unit root test associated with the variable 1 as well as variable 2. That unit root test I am performing with the drift for both of them. And it should uh, not reject the null hypothesis, which means it should give me that both of them are non-stationary. And after that, I am trying to fit the model and try to look out for the non-stationarity of the residual. And when I am trying out the non-stationarity of the residuals, I am getting a p-value less than 0 0.05. So, I am able to reject the null hypothesis wherein I am concluding that the residuals are more or less stationary. So, when I am getting this kind of a situation, the original data values are non-stationary and the residuals after fitting the model, after fitting a linear model between them, the residuals are coming out to be more and more stationary. That is what will lead us to discover that both the variables are co-integrated and which will give me the second step. The second step associated in co-integration is an error correction model. Right? In the second step, we will be talking about an error correction model ECM. So, basically talking about which is more and more of a dynamic kind of a model which typically talks about to at what at what rate at what speed the system moves back to the static equilibrium that is what is being understood by this error correction model to what extent the values are moved back to your static model which is what is your summary that has come out with respect to your uh, earlier model that we have fitted for our residuals. So, at what speed and how the system moves back to the static equilibrium. For that, we are simply looking at, first of all, two variables. Probably, I uh, will call it as difference in mid-cap prices. So, wherein I am taking dip of the indval dollar mid cap I am taking one variable difference in the mid cap prices difference in the sensex values I am taking one more diff indval dollar sensex so I have taken the difference of both of them I will also take the error lag term what is my error lag term I will take the lag value of my error term with a k value equal to minus 1. We have already applied this. How do I get the lag of one period before? Now, this is where we get our modified or this is where I get the model that is associated with my error correction. In this, we will try to fit a linear model between here two things. I am trying to fit a model between the differences associated with my mid cap as the dependent variable but in the independent variable along with taking the differences associated with the sensex value 
I'll also take the error that is associated with the previous period. That is what is the improvisation or the error correction that is coming as a part of my model. When there is a co-integration, that is the kind of an error correction that is typically coming up. So now when you look at the summary that is associated with mod underscore ECM, there is a possibility that your hedge ratio is improved. Look at this. So here we got the coefficient as 0.42. So earlier the hedge ratio was around 0 0.40 or something. Now the hedge ratio has actually become 0.42. There is a slight improvement by considering the non-stationarity of the behavior between both the values. So by considering the presence of a long-term relationship between the mid-cap prices as well as the sensex prices, we are able to improvise the hedge ratio a little bit. Right? So, whatever, whenever the large deviations are going to come out, right? If you look at uh, the error term, the coefficient that is associated with the error term is a negative small value. But whatever is the coefficient that is associated with the error term, because it is negative, when there is some deviation between the prices, that is going to be corrected. So there is a kind of a long-term stable relationship that is going to come. So basically, this is how when you really find that your data is non-stationary, we try to work out the co-integration process between the data items to really fit in the relationship between the two time series data. So basically when you observe the two time series data exhibiting more and more non-stationarity kind of a behavior, the better way to build the relationship between them is using the co-integration process and that is what I have demonstrated through the usage of the ARCA package. If you have any further queries regarding the same, you can very well get back to me by giving me a call on the number that I have provided below or you can even send in an email at wapsi.com. Thanks a lot for listening to this uh, session. Thank you very much.